Hello, everybody, and welcome to all those who have joined us for tonight's webinar and also the viewers who are watching the recording afterwards. Big crowd tonight, as far as we know. I think it's been one of the most popular topics that um, MHPN's put forward, so it's wonderful. Great to have you. MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respect to elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. Steve Trumbull is my name and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by background, uh, although I've worked in medical education really all of my career at Monash and then Melbourne and now Deakin Universities, um, and I'm located on the land of the Wadungarung people. Um, now, we have a fabulous panel tonight to do justice to what is such an important topic. You will have seen the bios that came out with the webinar invitation, so in the interest we cover as much of their content as possible and lots of time for questions, we'll skip going over the panel bios. Um, but you can see the panellists there in front of you, and I'll go around in order of how we'll go through the um, presentations. So starting with you, Andrew, welcome. Thanks, Steve, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Leach. I'm a GP uh, in Western Australia and uh, very interested in this area and looking forward to speaking tonight. Great. Now, we've got a lot of people on from Western Australia tonight by the look of what's in the chat room, so that's great. Um, what was it that particularly led you to focus in this area of, of general practice or clinical practice? I find this to be a fascinating area. It's so challenging but so rewarding. Um, and I, I think some of the, my autistic patients and ADHD patients are some of the most interesting and um, uh, charismatic, but also highly intelligent um, people that I see and really um, grateful for the support when they get a, a thorough, comprehensive review in, in general practice. So that's, for me, the, the, the most important thing. I find it really rewarding. That's great, Andrew. And certainly mm -hmm. as a GP, your heart gets a bit of a lift when somebody comes into your room who is engaging and interesting, isn't it? So that's mm -hmm. great. Now, speaking of engaging and interesting, now, Monique, you're the second presenter, I think. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what led you to practice in this particular area? Hi, um, I'm Monique Mitchelson, and I'm a neurodivergent clinical psychologist. So I'm late diagnosed autistic and ADHD. And I got drawn to working in this area um, because the first sort of major workplace that I worked in after uni was a private practice that specialized in autism and ADHD um, with a supervisor that was very affirming. Um, and then I got my diagnosis. My husband got his diagnosis. Um, a few family members got their diagnoses. So that's really furthered my interest. Oh, fantastic. And we always find these webinars go exceptionally well when there's somebody on the panel with lived experience, but also to be a clinician working in the area, it's going to be a wonderful night tonight. So thank you so much. Thank so you. in the presentations after Monique, we'll go to Emma. Welcome, Emma. Can you um, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what led you to this area of practice? Certainly. Um, so my name is Emma Ketley and I'm a mental health occupational therapist. And similarly to Monique, I'm also a late diagnosed neurodivergent person with a diagnosis of ADHD from 2022. Um, and my work with mental health, I realized there was so much intersectionality between the diagnosis of mental health and neurodivergency that it just really excited me and got me interested. Fantastic and great to have a mental health OT on the panel. That's an area that we often don't spend a lot of time looking at in these webinars. So. You'll have a lot of good input tonight. And you also, I believe, you um, you coordinate one of the MHPN networks. This is the other thing that MHPN does, obviously, is the networks across Australia. What do you enjoy about that coordinator role? Presuming you do yeah. enjoy that coordinator role. I'm not being presumptive here. <laughs> no, I certainly do enjoy it. Um, I set that up last year, the ADHD um, WA network for the Mental Health Professionals Network. Um, in recognition, really, of the federal resource and inquiry into mental, mental health and ADHD care, realising that working in the adult space with neurodivergency, I had had very little training and I perceived very little personal development opportunities. So I got together with the MHPN 
um, to secure, secure funding to roll out the network for WA. And we've had three meetings now, and it's been great to see the interest from other colleagues and professionals. That's fabulous. And um, uh, Monique, you'll be interested. Somebody's recognised your voice from your podcast. So it just shows that all the different methods of reaching out to people actually do work. So that's uh, that's that's really good. Um, well spotted to that person in the uh, in the chat group. Um, and now the fourth presentation, and we've structured it uh, on the suggestion of the panel, pretty much as this young person would probably make their way through the health system, is Joe McDonald. So, Joe, could you introduce yourself, your clinical role, and what led you to practice in that area particularly? Yeah, hi. I'm a neuropsychiatrist uh, from Newcastle, New South Wales. Um, started my training in neuropsychiatry clinics and spent a, a fair proportion of my training time there and found the, the work very rewarding and really liked the um, the uh, opportunities both for collaboration but also the neuroscience aspect. So that's what, what drew me to this field. Great. Fantastic. And wonderful to have such a great panel. We've got lots to talk about. And I won't read through the learning outcomes. Uh, next slide, please, I think, because you've 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 seen all those. Um, but we'll go. Oh, and also just to mention um, the slide uh, relating to the fact that this, the content of this webinar, and I've lost track of where we are with the slides, the content of this webinar is for educational purposes only and is not clinical advice. We're here to learn from each other not to treat each other or to offer clinical advice. And if there's anything in the webinar that causes you distress, it's absolutely understandable, please do seek out care from your own GP, your local mental health service or practitioner, or contact Lifeline on 131114. So let's rip into the presentations now, and we'll start with Andrew. Andrew, have 10 seconds. <laughs> Thanks, no, Steve. Got, and you've got, I, you've got time. I'm uh, glad we made it. Um, I want to sort of just take this uh, from a general practice perspective and a primary care perspective to start with as Oscar has come in with his family member and is probably quite anxious and may not even want to be coming in to see us. And I think that's first important to recognise that we may not have um, an overly productive first session, but certainly some a time or a chance to build rapport with Oscar and to get to know him um, and reconnect with him. Um, he may have had a period of time where he hasn't actually been seen by any medical service or by his uh, allied health team. So just sort of gently coming back to, to finding um, what's been going on for him. And it may take time. It may take a number of consultations and may, may need to rebook him to come back. But maybe that first uh, visit is, is really just a, a listening session, getting to know him, building that rapport, um, letting him know that we're here to support him and, and try and figure out what's been challenging for him. Some of that history might come collaterally through his family. And um, taking a really strengths-based approach is, is probably a great way to start. And we know that he loves his, his gaming, his Fortnite, his PlayStation. Um, I have uh, learned about many games uh, and Fortnite seems to be the number one. So, you know, pulling Fortnite up on my computer screen, showing him, you know, this is what I know about it and asking him a bit about what he's doing on the games uh, to really try and engage with him. It might be the icebreaker that we need just to start that process. Next slide, please. So then we sort of need to go back to the drawing board a little bit. Oscar's had a gap in, in support. Potentially, we need to find out a bit about what happened with um, the last few years, what's been going on for him, a bit more about the diagnosis. There may be some information on the file and the record, but it's always good to start um, fresh and look at things again holistically and broadly. Um, so understanding how that diagnosis came to be and how it was made and also then whether it's um, evolved or changed since it was made back in his primary school years um, and what treatments might be in place because it sounds like he has stopped uh, taking those medicines at home. Uh, but all, all GPs are good at this and, and that's thinking broadly. Um, this might not be related to the medications or the ADHD and autism. It might be related to something else. And he's in his room a lot. Is he sleeping well or uh, is body clock completely reversed? Uh, is he on any screens throughout the night? And is that impacting his mental health and his mood? 
really important to think about mental health. Uh, is there a depression or an anxiety emerging? We know there can be a correlation between mental illness and neurodiversity. So uh, important to screen. And I was thinking about psychosis as well. If he's become withdrawn, is there something else going on that hasn't been considered such as uh, a psychotic episode? Next slide. So I, I'm assuming that, you know, Oscar is going to be withdrawn and quiet, but if he's not, I'm really happy to engage with him and involve him in this process. Um, and, and just because someone else has brought him in to see me, I, I still feel that it's very important to let him know what we're thinking and what is going on without over concern, without making him more anxious, but just letting him know that he's very welcome and we want to try and work through some of these things with him. So it might involve some tests or some extra uh, reviews or go, going to see someone else that you know is uh, going to help me but I, I just like to be upfront and and involve him in that process um, not exclude him because potentially he's not able to make eye contact or he's feeling really overwhelmed by this um, so how can we help him through that and I, I think that might take a few steps to build rapport next slide so with that broad screening, uh, I might use my K10 or DAS21, again, depending on how engaged Oscar is in this process, or using uh, the collateral history from the family and asking them a little bit about what they've seen going on for Oscar over the last period of time. Um, doing a general blood screening, always helpful. We tend to pick up something from that uh, broad screen of iron and thyroid and vitamin D and other vitamins because quite often uh, food has become, nutrition has become something that may not have been uh, as well um, supported as it could have been. Uh, again, thinking medically, do we need to do anything else in-house, you know, ECG or blood sugar or, or a urine drug screen? Is, is Oscar um, starting to smoke marijuana or is there something else going on behind the scenes that we don't know about? So just very broad, and I may not do all of these things. I'm just thinking what potentially I could in include in my um, tests. Next slide. So as quite often is the case, building a team so that we have a support network involved to help Oscar. And uh, as you would all be aware, you know, involving a psychology psychologist or an OT, um, plus maybe a support worker, maybe a speech therapist, th those sort of allied health network that we need to rebuild. Oscar may already have connections, but what often happens is there is a disconnect between the child's system, the pediatric system and the adult system. And that team may have become lost or he may have been lost to follow up. Um, exercise so important and that may be supported by an exercise physiologist I find them a great way to just re-engage with going to the gym or re-engage with the sport and get back to being active even just going for walks having someone to work with him so he doesn't feel the pressure to do it himself or the family don't feel that pressure next slide so we might do a mental health plan. We might utilize the NDIS to help fund some of those services. Um, and down the track, I'll look again at that medication. If it is something that's become a problem because he's, he stopped taking it, do we need to actually put that responsibility back to someone else for now so that he is reminded to take it? Or is it simply just a matter of he's forgetting and he's not noticing the medication needs to be taken? We need to develop a system for him. Um, some of those good tools tools we have in GP, such as a care plan or a health assessment, might be able to also help us to gauge the goals for Oscar moving forward so that we can get to where he wants to be and where he wants to reach uh, over the next period of time. And then getting back to his sleep, is, does he need some melatonin or does he need an antidepressant to help with his anxiety and what's going on for him with his mental health? Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, and I should just jump in and remind people, which I didn't say in the introduction, that if you want to ask a question of the panel, please do use the ask question button, which is down the bottom. If you move your mouse, and it, or if you're on a mobile, you're going to use your finger, I think, obviously, um, down the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, the it should become active, and there should be the three little dots down the bottom there. And if you click on the three little dots, it'll give you... Where is it? Ask a question. If you click on that, then you can post a question and we'll try and pull all those together to ask the panel uh, towards the end. So bottom right-hand corner, hover over the dots there and uh, you should be able to ask a question. So thank you so much. Now, um, our um, the young man, um, 
Oscar has found his way to uh, Monique now. So we'll hear from you. Thanks, Monique. Sure. Um, so when Oscar presents to the psychologist's clinic, um, it may have been possibly like the first contact that he's had in terms of therapy. Um, so often when people are coming into therapy for the first time, because he has, you know, gone through an assessment process as a child, it's often spending that first session making sure things like the sensory environment are okay, especially if the person's autistic. So asking the client, you know, if they find anything in the room um, difficult for them sensory-wise, um, asking how they learn information best and retain information best from an executive functioning point of view, being explicit and explaining, you know, these are the rules and expectations of therapy, you know, this is how I work, um, getting information from the client, getting that history. And then really I think exploring for Oscar um, – yeah, does he have an understanding of his neurodivergence, so his autism and ADHD? Because often people diagnose as children, you know, no one may have ever explained what does that actually mean for them um, or they may have done therapy or gone through services as a child but don't remember, um, you know, what was told or the tools that they, you know, were shown earlier on. And just making sure to help Oscar understand his neurotype through an affirming lens, because often information about diagnoses can be delivered in quite a deficit focused lens, um, which can make people feel, um, you know, defective or worthless and hopeless. So actually exploring, you know, the difference in his neurology, what are his strengths, what are the areas that he may need more support with? Um, does he understand himself and his needs and, yeah, has he accepted his neurodivergence? Um, and I think that's that's a really good place to start off with. Next slide, please. So um, I like to work uh, in a multidisciplinary team because often people will have lots of support needs. Um, so usually if people have sensory needs or needing assistance with daily living tasks, I'll refer to an occupational therapist to do a sensory profile. Um, all autistic people should know their sensory profile. It's very helpful in um, avoiding burnout and the effects on mental health um, and meltdowns and shutdowns and looking at a functional capacity assessment, which is really helpful in, you know, what supports does that person need with day-to-day -day tasks. I'll then do an executive functioning assessment um, if the person's an adhd -er. And what I like to use is the brief because it gives you a really great profile that you and the client can go through of what are their executive functioning strengths, what are the executive functions, what are the areas that they need support in, and you can actually work with that person individually to develop executive functioning strategies and then educate their family as well if you have their permission. So really bringing in executive functioning strategies. Um, otherwise, uh, there's often not a lot of movement for people um, in terms of their well-being and mental health. Next slide. Um, so exploring with Oscar perhaps, you know, why he hasn't, um, you know, been using his medication. There was difficulty for him remembering to take it in high school. Um, he feels like he doesn't need it. And just exploring, you know, some of the reasons why, because some people diagnose as children may have had, you know, an adverse experience with ADHD medication, or they feel like it was, you know, forced on them. Um, and it's just reminding them that you're an adult now, no one can force you to take medication. Um, you know, in terms of ADHD medication, it's your choice um, and exploring maybe some of the barriers and negative experiences or beliefs that might be blocking him from utilizing medication. Um, so then, you know, keeping in contact with the GP and liaising um, is really important. And then keeping in contact with psychiatrist um, and usually uh, that will be with ADHD medication, review and any other co-occurring stuff that, um, you know, Oscar might need support with regarding medication as well. Next slide. Um, so when you're working with a neurodivergent person as a psychologist, uh, I work in a neuroaffirming way. Um, so affirming the person's identity and adapting um, existing therapies to suit the person, be individualized and trauma-focused. 
And often when working um, with autistic and ADHD people, there is high co-occurrence with mental health and we're aiming to treat the mental health, not to uh, cure or fix the autism or ADHD. So often it's helping people cope with change, uncertainty, um, working on people regarding anxiety and low mood, um, the loss of employment. So for autistic people in particular, um, the loss of that routine would be a massive thing to cope with and routine helps scaffold ADHD as well. Um, and exploring things like self-worth, identity. And for Oscar, you know, his employment was linked to his special interests and it can be really devastating as an autistic person to lose a link to your special interest or being able to talk about your interests. Um, exploring with Oscar, has he had any mental health education before? Not making assumptions and really making sure to explain things thoroughly. And what were some of the therapies, if he has had therapy before that worked for him, what didn't and exploring why is really important. And really looking at, is he linked in with other neurodivergent people? Because, um, yeah, often neurodivergent people socialize through their interests and passions. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, socializing with other neurodivergent people is a little bit easier due to something called the double empathy theory. Um, so I'd look at connecting him with the neurodivergent community um, who can validate some of his experiences and provide some support. Next slide. Um, also looking at linking him in with disability employment services in terms of job seeking. Um, and I think just recognizing that often um, autism and ADHD, the rhetoric has been that it's something that is, you know, diagnosed in childhood. And we really aim to, I guess, bring in support so that the person no longer needs support as an adult. And often that's actually not the case. So both autism, ADHD and neurodevelopmental. And that means people often do need ongoing support across the lifespan and often need increasing support at different times in adulthood, you know, because the expectations and the burdens of adult life often are more and the responsibilities are more. So particularly when working, getting a pay rise, promotion um, for people having kids, opening their own business, and for women going into perimenopause and menopause. So those are the areas that people do need more support in. Um, that's it for me. Great. Thank you so much. And some fabulous responses in the chat room to what both you uh, and Andrew have said. Um, you're obviously really striking a chord with people. Um, I should also just quickly say, to apologise to people, we can't use the closed captions. They're just not reliable with the technical uh, content. They've got to be proofed before they go out, but they will be on the recording. I know that's not ideal for people who prefer the captions, but they will be there on the recording, and the recording will be coming uh, in due course. And also a final ad for the questions. If you want to ask those, you've got to move your mouse down the bottom right-hand corner, hover over those dots, and the ask a question thing will pop up. A few people have found it already, um, mainly to um, tell me that their screen's frozen, in which case you refresh. Um, wouldn't it be nice if life was like that? But thank you both uh, to Andrew and to Monique, and Monique for just giving us her views then. We'll now move to Emma. And Emma, there's already been a question about the OTs in this field and the um, the sensory assessments and whether they need to be referred um, to the OT or whether you can do those off your own bat. But I'll let you give your presentation first. Okay, all right. And I'll answer that question perhaps afterwards. So meeting Oscar now, we've met him at, as, as a 22-year-old. He's presented with his parents reporting some behaviours of concern. They're concerned about his sleep cycle, they're perhaps concerned that they feel that he's gaming a bit too much. Um, he has no formal support, but he does live with his family. And all of these behaviours of concern have come about in the transition of him moving from his place of employment at the hardware store, which, as we said, has scaffolding some of his, his executive functioning, perhaps has provided him with a regular routine. And he's now transitioned somewhat unexpectedly to being made redundant. We know previously when he had a transition around the age of the end of high school that he had become so dysregulated with that transition and the loss of support that he'd actually engaged in self-harm, biting himself on a significant injury. 
this is again another crucial time and it's no tea I'm going to be working with him with curiosity being affirming as to respecting his sense of agency as an adult to help him engage in meaningful activities around what he needs to do what he wants to do and what he feels he's expected to do the next slide please There's going to be a number of considerations um, outside of what we would consider neuronormative in working with someone with ADHD and autistic. And as a person of lived experience, I also kind of understand this. So we might expect him to blurt info dump when we're talking. That's not Oscar being rude. That's actually Oscar being very, very engaged with us. So it's a compliment, not a criticism. Um, there might be some sensory pen sensory perceptual differences, which is why Monique has mentioned the sensory profile. And I also want to point out that even though we're going into his home environment or meeting him wherever he chooses, we're actually in additional demand because we're actually introducing him to someone he's not familiar with. And so our prime aspect, our prime priority should be about making him feel relatingly safe. So you can't see it right now, but I've, my favorite jumper is a dinosaur jumper and I love dinosaur fidgets so I will actually probably have some of those because that's his special interest and that's how we can form connections. Next slide please. So as I said Oscar's work was a fantastic scaffold. Whenever there had been a transition and a loss of support from outside of that environment or within that environment whenever there's been a transition it's actually increased demand. So Oscar's work, volitionally, he was engaged, he had values, he felt purpose, he was volitionally engaged, so that got a thumbs up. Habitually, it met the need of having somewhere safe, secure, regular and routine. And it was well within his performance skills. He was able to do the job easily. And actually, he enjoyed doing things like the technical components, and we know he did that well because of his manager's feedback. So I will always be highlighting those strengths and skills are still there, but because it's a dynamic disability, there's going to always be an interplay with the environment. But as a summary point, his work was an enabling environment. It enabled him to have a sense of professional identity and it provided scaffolding. Right now, we have unexpected redundancy, which is hard for anyone. And for Oscar, we all behaviour is communication. So volitionally, by engaging in the gaming, he's telling us what activities he feels connected to that make him feel safe and that he's interested in. And that's something to respect because that's his communication. He is experiencing a loss of habituation. He's lost his work role and that structure. And his performance skills, he's not, it may look de like decompensation, but again, it's because transactionally within that environment, he actually might not have the opportunities to function independently depending on the family's level of creating those opportunities for him. So my question with curiosity is to really explore with him how does he feel that current environment support or limit what his goals, dreams and aspirations are? Again, respecting his sense of agency. Next slide, please. There is a big stop sign. Again, I qualified back in 20, 20, 2002, sorry. Um, and perhaps some of the features of what we're looking at look like depression. He's, he's talking about feeling worthless, having no purpose, and he looks like he's socially withdrawing. We want to consider, though, his brain type, because it might not be depression, it might be autistic burnout, and maybe it's both. But with his behaviour helping communicate, he's actually telling us what he needs, what he's seeking to feel safe and secure. So our job is to collaborate and partner with him, recognising where he's at and make him feel relationally safe within our engagement with him and to take smaller steps, recognising that day to day, each visit, he might have a preferred time, he might have, he might want to have engaged in certain activities and we will do that at his pace, step by step. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. The importance of kind of really determining whether it's autism, burnout or depression is that obviously he's at high risk if we 
dive straight into capacity building as occupational therapists. If we look at unloading too many assessments all, all at once or having raised neuromajorative or neuronormative ideas around treating depression. So we're going to really work with him around understanding what these behaviours of concern are actually functionally doing for him, what what needs and wants they're actually meeting for him. We're going to look and reflect back his current strengths and enabling environment. And I will be doing this through having interviews with him um, and his family, also perhaps administering the HUDA, looking at the sensory profile so we can look at where the, the triggers are and the glimmers, those little moments of enjoyment. And also executive functioning. We can meet all of those um, questions we might have executive functioning by seeing him engage in activities. And like the other panels said, we may also want to consider co-occurring health issues, sensory processing issues, any other mental health, or even like unrecognized chronic pain or anything else that could be part of his profile. Our intervention will be about engaging him in a safe client-led way, which will be affirming and strength-focused. And we're going to work to address the overwhelm and the burnout first. So we're going to have an activity plan that will decrease demand and look at increasing support, formal or informal, adapting tasks so that they're simpler and more engageable. And as I said, identifying those moments of joy, those glimmers. We're going to work with his nominated support and we're going to have ongoing MDT communication. And then once we've done that, we've got to a point where he feels safe and contained and it's led by him, then then we might consider behavioural activation, ADL, capacity building, and look at consultation and advocacy, maybe an NDIS assessment, an application, DEF refer referral, or even revisiting study. And all throughout, we'll look at MDT communication and referral to other professionals as required. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. And you've anticipated a question in the chat about the glimmer, and you've explained it's those little glimpses of lightness and enjoyment. So that's great. Thanks for getting ahead of the game on that. Speaking ahead of the game, I should just give people a bit of a warning. We probably will go about five minutes over to make up with the for the five minutes we lost when fiddling around at the technical side. Um, so if people can delay their dinner or bedtime or whatever it is, um, uh, please hang out for that extra five minutes or so towards the end. And now, um, Joe, uh, Oscar's found his way to you as a psychiatrist, or can you um, tell us your approach, please? Yeah, uh, thanks, Steve. I'll try and um, move through this um, relatively quickly so that I can leave some um, time for questions. But essentially, I'll start off um, looking at... Um, a bit of an overview as to um, co-occurring autism and, and ADHD. And really to say that <clears throat> the diagnosis of both uh, autism spectrum disorder and ADHD was really only permitted by the DSM-5, um, which was released in 2013. And so as opposed to ADHD and, and autism alone, there really is limited literature in regards to this population with the combined presentation. But nevertheless, uh, based on the evidence and uh, what we see in clinical practice is that it is relatively common. So the estimated prevalence of ADHD and autism is approximately 38%. And the, the possible explanations for this relationship are, are quite complex. Uh, next slide, please. So just um, for my approach, looking at the case study, these are my first impressions and the issues uh, as I would see them. So we can see that there are difficulties in occupational and interpersonal um, functioning, which are more acute recently. We also have a history of difficulties with emotion regulation, uh, particularly in that year 11 period in which there were sensory sensitivities also which culminated to self-harm. And so that's something that I would want to address in my assessment. We have quite a sudden decline in mental state following a termination of employment. And so that'll be an area of inquiry. And we can still see that um, Oscar uh, does use his parents to assist with occupational functioning. But uh, 
based on the vignette, we presume that there are really limited social supports outside of, of the family. Uh, next slide, please. So when thinking about um, the assessment, I'd be first looking at the approach. So the first uh, point I think is who are we going to get information from? And so that might include family. And I'd ask Oscar if there's anyone else who would be important to get information from. But we want to also be careful uh, not to infantilize uh, Oscar. And so it's important to respect confidentiality and to work collaboratively. Um, an appointment of this nature may need to be longer than what is generally used for an initial assessment. And what I might say to someone like Oscar is, um, if you feel as though you need a break, feel, please feel free to leave the room and you can come back in when you, when you feel ready. Um, we want to avoid the, the feeling for Oscar of being trapped or feeling as though he needs to remain seated the entire time, particularly for a long appointment. Initially, what I would then do is look at exactly what are the symptoms of concern. So try and avoid medical language and just get to the bottom of what the exact concerns are and what their timeline is. How did When did they start and how did they develop, particularly if things are either improving the same or getting worse. And throughout the assessment, what I would be doing is screening for potential comorbidities. And so when someone usually says me, and this might be for example, six or eight months after the initial decline, I would be thinking, well, why isn't Oscar getting better? Is there something that is potentially being missed? And so I would be looking at depressive disorders, anxiety, issues with sleep, perhaps an undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder, whether there is an independent eating disorder, new substance use, or more severe but lower prevalence comorbidities like psychosis, bipolarity, and catatonia. We have to be aware of diagnostic overshadowing. What that means is we don't want to attribute features that are developmentally um, usual for Oscar as evidence of a mental disorder that may not exist. So we wouldn't want, for example, um, Oscar's fixed interest to be used as evidence of, say, withdrawal and then inappropriately start treatment for a mental disorder that isn't relevant and contribute to polypharmacy. So you, we then have to be careful about the, the symptoms that we're ascribing to a potential um, comorbidity. And so I would be looking for things like anhedonia, which is a complete loss of interest in um, his usual activities, suicidal thoughts, and psychomotor disturbance. And by psychomotor disturbance, I mean um, slowed movements. Maybe Oscar isn't moving that much at all. Or the opposite, so psychomotor agitation, lots of movement, lots of pacing, and a change from his baseline. The age of onset is important to consider. So newer symptoms in, adol in adolescence, for example, uh, may be more relevant to a mood disorder rather than symptoms that appeared, say, when Oscar was five or six. And a risk assessment. And the two main risks that I would be looking at here is obviously the risk of self-harm or suicidal thoughts, but also the risk of his oral intake and weight loss is an important consideration. Uh, next slide, please. And so <clears throat> for someone like Oscar, I would be routinely screening for a history of epilepsy or ticks, uh, which are relevant to treatment, and also hypothyroidism, other medical um, confounders which may mimic a, a mental disorder. I'd be looking at his current medications, history of side effects, and any reasons why Oscar might have stopped taking his medication, say for side effects or stigma, for example. And then looking at any sort of vulnerability to, to mental health issues, so looking through the family, say, is there a family history? of depression or bipolar disorder that may colour our impressions and raise our suspicion of comorbidity. I'd be reviewing the circumstances of the diagnosis uh, of autism and ADHD, looking at what led to the presentation, what were the symptoms of concern from his parents at that time, and take a developmental history. And this might be something that isn't achievable at the first 
um, initial presentation, but something that I would be thinking about filling in um, longitudinally. In the examination, um, I'd certainly be looking for features of catatonia. And during that time, I, I wouldn't be inspecting specifically for signs of self-injury, but I would just be aware of that, say, looking for signs of, say, bite marks on his hands or, um, say, injuries to his, to his head based on just the historical pattern of self-harm. Um, I routinely take a heart rate, blood pressure. I would weigh Oscar and, and get a BMI for, for a number of reasons. One, if um, Oscar's oral intake is inadequate, then it may be a medical emergency or we might have to escalate medical treatment. I might have to involve other colleagues and a dietitian. Also, um, psychotropic medications frequently come with metabolic side effects, and so we want to monitor for weight gain as well. And I'd review any relevant pathology, which um, we, which Andrew alluded to, those kinds of blood tests. Next slide, please. So in terms of, of management, I've kept it fairly open-ended here based on the case. I'd want to make sure that the fundamentals uh, are also done, uh, done well. So we'd want a good MDT with psychology, occupational therapy, and speech pathology. Also, we may include a dietitian based on uh, Oscar's oral intake. I'd guide my management uh, not only by the diagnostic labels, but also by formulation. And so formulation in the psychiatry sense is really an, an, expl an explanatory statement as to why Oscar is here. So why in particular was the loss of his work and role important to Oscar at that time and identifying which supports may be able to help us in carrying out our management plan. There really is limited guidance from the literature in regards to pharmacotherapy in individuals with both autism and ADHD. But the overall principles are that cautious titration should be considered. There tends to be higher rates of adverse effects and difficulties tolerating treatment. And we'd be considering the risks and using that also to help us inform what the follow-up period might be and what type of follow-up is important. And so overall, that would be my approach. Thank you, Joe. And so good to see so many comments in the chat that how important it is to see a neuro-affirming neuro psychiatrist. In fact, all the uh, professionals have been very um, positive and supportive and appropriate tonight. So I think that's just a, a great way to present your material. Lots of excellent content. Let's now get into some of the questions. And oh my Lord, there've been lots of questions uh, coming in. Um, one of the ones I wanted to get out of the way a bit earlier, I guess, is about the diagnosis. And this came up during the preparation for the webinar. And I'm going to claim some poetic license maybe, but when you work back through Oscar's age, at the age that he was diagnosed, probably what was in the book then would have been Asperger's syndrome. Uh, and we've given him uh, on the papers the diagnosis of um, uh, level one. Uh, so I don't know, Monique, are you well placed to tell us a little bit about that change and I guess and how um, clients view the terminology in that area? And yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Joe mentioned, when the DSM-5 came out in 2013, quite a few things changed regarding autism and ADHD. And one of the changes was that the term um, Asperger's was taken out of the DSM and instead we got autism spectrum disorder with different levels of support needs. And um, within the autistic community, there has been um, a bit of, uh, I guess, discomfort with the term Asperger's since about 2011 when a historian looked through archival material and, yeah, basically found that Hans Asperger, whilst he wasn't a member of the Nazi party in World War II, that he did play a role in sending disabled kids to be euthanized. Um, so, yeah, trigger warning. Um but basically, um, I guess the debate around the term Asperger's is that he kept the kids that had the high intellectual capacity and capacity for language, and then the children that were not deemed worthy of being part of society were sent to die, basically. And so that's where dislike of the term Asperger's has come from within the autistic community. So the term Aspie and stuff like that is not really 
favored. Um, there will be individuals who maybe of older generations or were young children that were given that term. Um, and, you know, it, it's up to each individual what they would like to use to refer to themselves or what, you know, they identify with. But a lot of people, including professionals, aren't aware of the historical context and, you know, that updated information. So I think it's important to talk about it um, because I didn't learn about it in my training. Only recently through the autistic community did I learn about that and the terminology. Thank you for those insights. Does anybody else want to make a comment about the diagnosis that we've got for Oscar here and how important that is to what happens next? I mean... There's lots of elephants in this room at the moment, and one of the ones is about access to services, of course. And there's been quite a lot of um, uh, discussion in the chat about um, not getting access to uh, um, disability services. Um, any thoughts about that? Because what the question that's leading to is how do people go about getting a good diagnosis when there aren't a lot of uh, really skilled practitioners on the ground? That's an impossible question, but... Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Let's, let's do the referrals first. Um, what are your tips for finding practitioners who can really help in this area? What do you look for? I might start, Steve. Yeah, please do, Andrew. Yep. Uh, this is a really challenging area, and I know it's occurring across Australia. I know in Western Australia here we're having a lot of um, challenges in accessing services. Uh, it's, it's challenging because um, patients are... Uh, not only have to, or they not only have to spend more money to access uh, help, they have to do a lot more work in trying to find that help and find a team that they connect with and build that team. So it might take months to years to find the right people. Um, and that is not only just with diagnosis, um, but also with therapy and treatment. And there's a huge demand for services. So I think in in terms of what that means for, for us in primary care is we spend a lot more time holding on to patients, spending more time thinking a bit more broadly and doing a little bit more work with them and maybe reviewing them more regularly. I try to get them back uh, once every quarter for a long appointment just to do those check-ins and make sure they're on the right track, even if we don't have the right team ready to go. Um, and, and that then it provides opportunity to do more investigations if needed or, or think about other things that we can do in the that meantime so certainly have to think on the on the go with that and I've learned a lot about uh this area on, on how to um, fill those gaps and voids and also get to know who is in your area who are the people that you that you trust and often those referrals get a more triaged uh if they do trust so you're us a bit of a unicorn there us. you're an unusual GP what about others are there other practitioners in your pantheon who you might call upon? I'm thinking of everybody from mental health social workers to speech pathologists. I mean, there must be others you can draw upon who could help um, in these. Yes. Yes, I think in, in this area, you start to get to know people really well and you and then start to have, you know, even case conferences and, and things like that. You start to really um, have a, a little network and, and not uh, uncommon for me to send a text message to someone saying, would you please mind, you know, helping out with this person or can would you be open to accepting this referral? So it sort of helps with the, the process and the journey for the patient, but it's not, it's not always that straightforward, but in your area, you tend to get to know that network and those, and those allied health professionals and even have some of them in-house in the clinic, which has been great. Right. What about the can others? I jump in? Yeah, Emma, do you yeah. have an entourage or a crew? I'm getting side um, eyes there, but do I, you? Do yeah, you I certainly do. Right, tell us um, about So obviously having the MHPN network in WA means that we've got a great list of practitioners and allied health and the whole MDT represented in people that regularly attend meetings because they've got a real passion. So... I think if I was looking for support for a family member, I would look for someone that has got a history of being really interest-led within this field because that curiosity is the foundation for learning and for good practice. And so when you've got the MHPNs and in your area and you've got an ADHD network, that's absolute gold for finding those supportive colleagues and or professionals to work with you or your family member. Fantastic. Uh, couldn't be better said. Thank you for that. Can I maybe take us in a different direction, though, because I'm conscious of time being shorter tonight. 
Um, there's been a lot of just questions about gender differences and the, the way different genders present and the way you might approach people of different genders. What what are the panel's thoughts about um, uh, gender-specific aspects of these two conditions or aspects of a person? Um, I hey, think, yeah, <laughs> I, I guess in terms of the diagnostic criteria, like the diagnostic criteria um, and you know, a lot of the diagnostic assessments have been based mainly on observations of white young boys. So if you're anyone who's not a white young boy, um, you know, there are going to be biases in terms of some of the diagnostic criteria, um, what we were taught as clinicians as well, um, and how we interpret, um, you know, data and, and things like the ADOS, um, particularly for autism in adults and in women. Um, so I think it, it's just a matter of um, doing the training, doing reflection, getting good supervision, and trying to unpack some of the stereotypes and the biases um, the best that you can when working with, um, you know, people of different genders, different ethnicities and cultural backgrounds, um, and particularly adults as well. Um, and just being aware of the biases uh, often, you know, I think can be helpful as a clinician in terms of making sure we're doing the best service that we can um, and not letting people slip through the cracks who are actually autistic and ADHD. Um, Cause it can be quite hard to, I guess, you know, touching on what the question Steve brought up, it can be quite hard if you're an adult woman um, to find a clinician that's great at assessing and diagnosing autism and ADHD in adults, particularly if you internalize and mask your um, autistic and ADHD traits. Um, people who externalize tend to get picked up a bit better, but then I've had um, fellow colleagues, other clinical psychologists that were very externalized as children and adults that did not get picked up for diagnosis because of stereotypes and bias. Um, so I think we really need updated tools. We need updated training. Um, and I hope some of those are in the pipeline and particularly with the national autism strategy coming out at the end of the year, there will be an emphasis on updated training for all um, allied health and medical professionals that will be neuroaffirming, co-designed, um, co-presented by autistic and ADHD people and clinicians, um, you know, make sure that that lived experience is being heard as well as the data. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, I might, uh, there's a question I really want to get onto the, the webinar um, tonight, which was asked several times by people in the lead up, which was about what happens when there's some resistance to the diagnosis, either from the person themselves or their families. And there's been quite a lot of chat in the group about um, how you support families. What is people's approaches, each of you, I guess? How do you approach it when there is some pushback against um, a solid diagnosis being made in this area? How do you how do you go about um, approaching that? Joe, did you have any... I'll start at the psychiatry end, I guess. What do you do when somebody is resistant to the diagnosis? Um, well, to be honest, uh, because I only see adults um, and to see a psychiatrist in Australia is not the easiest of tasks um, when it comes to health. It can be a longer wait list. It can be ex expensive. I don't typically see people who themselves um are resistant to the diagnosis, to be honest. And in fact, I think one of the changes that I've seen in my practice over the past few years is just such a precipitous increase in awareness that people are usually actually quite eager to not only undergo an assessment, but to hear um, what the impression is. So I think what is perhaps more common is uh, the stigma surrounding disclosing the diagnosis to, say, family, friends, partner. Um, <clears throat> and, I mean, I, I think there's, there's an additional element to that in adulthood in that people also look back on their own lives and, and say, if only 
I was identified earlier, if only treatment could have been initiated earlier. And there can, because quite often um, what we see is comorbidity, whether it might be elements of low self-esteem, um, episodes of failed treatment previously um, because of um, perhaps not considering neurodevelopmental aspects to the presentation, um, that there can be a real re reluctance to disclose. One thing that I routinely offer is uh, I will say if, if people find it helpful that they can certainly bring their partner um, or significant other to, to the appointment if they like and we can discuss it. Um, I think it's something that's very individual. It's going to depend on the um, relationship. And what I will say is there's no onus on them to disclose anything if they do not wish to do so. Um, and so that's my experience really treating treating adults. Great. Thanks for that. And I'm curious from the others um, who are probably seeing people a bit earlier in the piece, Emma or Monique or Andrew, what? how do you um, approach that? Steve, uh, it's quite interesting because I see a lot of children undergoing a diagnosis and the parents saying, uh, I also feel that, you know, I have autism or I have ADHD. And I think a lot of adults now or, or the, the um, adolescents even are recognising their own journey with this and potentially that they would meet the criteria or have a diagnosis. Not all of them are going on to get a diagnosis. So I think even just knowing that this is, part of them and if they wish to get a diagnosis you know that's something that might help them to then further understand themselves um quite the opposite again uh is is that you know there is little actually not as much resistance as as i would have thought and, and people are very open and accepting to this in fact frustrated if they don't get the sort of the answers that they were seeking um so a little bit of the opposite at the moment um but if someone is not keen on a diagnosis i absolutely would support that and and, and continue to work with them on whatever they would help them to um, to get to uh, understanding themselves better. Yep. Great. Thank you. And Emma, somebody's asked the question, Katrina's asked the question, can an OT make the diagnosis? Is this something that you do as part of your practice? No. So we don't actually make the diagnosis, but we can provide a lot of supporting collateral evidence for the symptomology. And working within MDT, we can then obviously work with a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist that can be informed by some of that behaviour. Because they, what is the great thing about OT is that we can meet people where they're at in terms of going to different environments. So if you've got someone that is high masking, you know, particularly we've talked about a bias perhaps with women being able to mask, I will actually be able to see them in their familiar environment where they feel safe and engaged in their special interests. So I'll actually be able to see another aspect of someone's presentation. Coming back to that diagnosis question, it is interesting. There is a lot of ambiguous loss. I work with adults. I'm an OT that works with adults, particularly around the emotional piece with ADHD and autism and sensory. And there is a lot of ambiguous loss when we have adults who are later diagnosed that sense of loss opportunities and you know that sadness of what could have been but the OT looking at the meaningful engagement the label to me whether if someone identifies with the label for their own volition that's great but for me I guess I'm looking at the functional implications of that mm -hmm. I'm trying to look at whether there's some of their their behaviors where we can work with them so their needs are met but it doesn't become for example, limitations to accessing services. So in right. Oscar's case, his his choice to kind of work within the gaming is not to carry on with gaming isn't an issue. But what might be an issue and a barrier to care is if he inverts his sleep cycle and ends up sleeping throughout the day when most support services would be in operation. Right. Well, thanks so much. You froze a little bit in the middle there, but that wasn't a problem. We understood everything you said. I think we can probably hold the satellite together for another 10 minutes if people can stick with us. Um, but I do want to ask just a few more questions before we get people to give their final um, wrap up uh, before we go. And I was going to go, I think, probably to Monique with a question from uh, Kiora, who's asking again about masking and that because of the 
comorbidities. People could have something like schizophrenia alongside the fact that they do have um, autism and um, ADHD, but they might mask some of their psychotic uh, symptoms because they're very good at it um, during the assessment with mental health professionals, but then all hell breaks loose when they get home. Is that something that we see with people with these complex mental health problems on top of who they are? Um, I think probably Joe would be a better person to ask about that um, in terms of like from the neuropsychiatry lens. For mm. me, as a clinical psychologist, usually if someone is acutely um, psychotic or unwell, that's when they usually are more under the care of inpatient services, mental health team, psychiatry, um, mental health nurses. If someone is acutely psychotic, I clinically would be looking at, you know, would they actually have the ability to mask in that situation? Because um, autistic masking is um, something that you do intentionally o over time, it can become almost subconscious, but it takes effort. So, you know, to make eye contact, an autistic person, is, you know, and, and I guess perform neurotypicality to make other people comfortable um, and to not get uh, bullied or discriminated against. You're in interactions deliberately thinking, okay, I need to make eye contact for the two seconds, then look away then make contact. Okay. Um, you know, make sure you don't have a flat facial expression on, make sure you're modulating your tone of voice. Am I making enough gestures, but not too many? Am I saying the right thing at the right time? So I don't offend people. Like there's lots of layers of thought, action, energy, and effort going into masking. Hence why it can be quite exhausting and lead to autistic burnout. So if someone's acutely psychotic, I would be clinically looking at, would they have the capacity to do that while psychotic? Does that resonate with you, Joe? Have you had this experience in your practice of somebody with that constellation? Yeah, and it is. Uh, it, it can be quite a complex process at arriving at an accurate diagnosis. Um, and the, the age that Oscar's at, <clears throat> this age, is really when we start to see um, quite complex psychiatric comorbidity emerge. So this would be the at-risk period for say something like schizophrenia to emerge. And the, the difficulty with schizophrenia in autism, and I'll just put the ADHD aside for a moment, is that its onset is usually insidious. So it's gradual and it's slow. The initial presentation wouldn't necessarily be an immediate acute psychotic episode. So we might see a prodrome, which is coming before the onset of psychotic symptoms of anxiety and depression. There's probably been a treatment with different psychotropic medications. We would then see usually the negative, what we call the negative features of schizophrenia. So difficulties with further difficulties with executive functioning and apathy. And you can see the difficulty in trying to tease that apart in certain aspects of autism. And then we might start to see the onset of psychotic symptoms. But even then with the onset of psychotic symptoms, sometimes it can be very difficult to arrive at a diagnosis because <clears throat> particularly in more, say, severe forms of autism, there might be unique aspects of speech that might confound an assessment for delusions or thought disorder. Or there might be um, styles of speech or interests they make it very difficult to try and decide if there's been a change in mental state. So really the importance, again, is going back to, to getting that developmental history, trying to find a baseline and how the person has departed from that baseline. When you add in the ADHD, it becomes more complex because um, the first line treatment for ADHD is usually stimulants. Stimulants will worsen psychosis. So then if we go to treat psychosis, say in the context of schizophrenia and are required to withdraw the stimulants, then we might see more externalising behaviours or dysregulation. And so it's quite a complex issue. Um, I'm not sure if that necessarily answers the, the question of masking. It might be more about the complexity, say, or the team trying to arrive at a diagnosis. I think it, it can be very complex. Sometimes it, it is not but I've certainly had cases where it is a very complex process.
that's been a feature of all the questions that have been coming in about people with trauma, people with um, um, gender identity issues, people with a whole lot of other things that are impacting on their or who they are. Uh, and it's becoming um, very difficult to tease these apart. We are going to have to bring it to a conclusion, though, I'm afraid. I'm not sure. Is there anything anybody wanted to say about any of the other questions that we might have had? Um, particularly, there were some questions about uh, supports within schools, I think, was something that um, was asked quite frequently beforehand. Uh, that can be problematic. It'll vary from state to state, I guess. I don't know. We can really get into it tonight, but getting some help from uh, the various professionals who can um, try to give strategies for use in schools would have to be the approach, I guess. But I'm sorry, we are going to have to move to the wrap-ups now. So I'm going to ask each of the presenters to give us their final thoughts in just a couple of minutes each, and we'll go through in the order uh, that people presented. So we'll start with you, Andrew. Thanks, Steve. And I think this for for a GP side uh, is that building of that team to create a collaborative network for the patient, to wrap ourselves around the patient, providing different inputs from different specialties. And that takes time as we've explored tonight, it takes time to find the right people and it, it doesn't always work perfectly. So we have to be patient and offer that our, our, um, our patient uh, regular follow-up so that we can um, look after them in between while they might be waiting to get the support that they need. Um, creating a neuroaffirming environment also in, in a general practice setting. So we, we don't want to be too threatening. We want to be quite empathetic and be really um, uh, sort of uh, strengths-based and, and uh, caring in, in how we um, speak with um, patients uh, who are autistic. Thanks, Steve. Right. Thank you so much. Monique? Um, I think the the best thing you can do as a psychologist is to go and do some training and personal reflection on, um, you know, the inherent biases that we all carry as human beings and do some neurodiversity affirming training, um, you know, that is co-led or led by someone who is um, autistic and ADHD, like has the lived experience because from the very start, you know, of the client's experience with you as the professional you can basically build that neuroaffirming language. And often when a diagnosis is delivered, um, you can really build a positive foundation for that person with their identity from when they're a small child so that you don't have to go and undo, you know, like all of the negative feedback and, you know, the negative stuff around getting a diagnosis and trying to reduce stigma, um, I think is really important. So if you're giving psychoeducation about autism and ADHD, diagnosis, adaptions to therapies in an affirming way, um, that's going to, yeah, really be helpful for the client. And I think just considerations that often people do need ongoing supports um, and sometimes one-on-one -on -one supports as well, like regardless of the level, level one people do still need support. That's in the DSM. It's not that you need no support. Um, and, yeah, I think just recognizing that often 10 sessions on a mental health care plan a year is not enough for people with neurodevelopmental differences. Um, and yeah, like the government really needs to invest more funding in supports for neurodevelopmental differences and disabilities and change some of the environments like the schools, like some of the hospital systems, um, you know, the funding systems, because for neurodivergent people, we often are the canary in the coal mine um, and the environment really can make or break us as well as the attitudes of the people around us. Thank you so much for those reflections. Emma, your views. Um, but neurodivergency is primarily a difference. It's a difference in brain wiring. And I guess that our environment can be enabling or disabling. And within that social, social model of disability, it's quite often how we deliver services and what we expect people, social expectations that limits people's participation. The biggest thing that we can we can do with our clients is not to lead a leave them with a legacy of distrust or suspicion because that in itself is an access issue for them. So 
you definitely go on lots of training, read up, listen to podcasts, do do whatever you, you kind of want to do to understand more, but also ask questions with the community. The biggest part of my training has been actually spending time with community and getting getting to hear their voice and getting to un- understand it so much clearer. And the biggest thing we can do to be affirming is to use that curiosity. And if we're not sure, just to ask. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. And use your networks. And Joe, final words from you. Thanks. Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate, I think it's important to structure the review correctly and I think listen deeply and not to just rely on the labels. I think coming up with a good formulation and a good um, explanatory statement and discussing that with the patient to build a shared understanding, I, I think will is always a good start to treatment. Right. Well, we got there. So thank you all so very much. If people can stay with us, a few more things just to mention now. Uh, the upcoming webinars will have a focus on people with borderline personality disorder. Uh, first of all, multidisciplinary strategies to navigate feelings of rejection and abandonment, hugely important. And that's on Tuesday, the 23rd of July. And then another one, looking at the principles of mentalization-based therapy in your practice, which is Monday, the 9th of September. Um, the podcast uh, on anger and mental health, a three-part series. Um, just search for MHN, MHPN Presents and your preferred podcast app. And while you're there, look for Monique's podcast as well and get into that. Um, you can also uh, join one of the more than 300 networks where mental health practitioners meet to share the richness that you've shared in the chat tonight about where you might find somebody who can help you in these areas. Um, so if you want to find out more about those online or in-person networks, uh, go to the MHPN website and have a look at what's there. So thank you so much for attending tonight. There will be a recording. It will be edited. All that bit in the middle will be cut out, which means I will age 10 years from before and after all that happens. So it'll be fascinating to watch, but it will be nicely edited. There'll be um, uh, proper uh, subtitles, captions that will be um, thoughtfully put together. And uh, that'll come out uh, and you'll be notified when that's available soon. Please fill out the survey. Um, click on the link down the bottom there for the survey um, and um, or scan the QR code that's there on the screen at the moment. Um, you will get statements of attendance. You will still get uh, CPD points for tonight because uh, I hope it's been as useful for you as it has been for me. And your statements will be on the MHPN portal in two weeks, which is and the recordings and the resources will be there in about one week. So before I close, I'd like to thank everybody for your perseverance tonight, but also to acknowledge people with lived experience of the conditions that we discuss on these webinars, and also the carers who have lived with mental illness in the past, um, and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present, as well as the conditions that make them who they are. So thank you to everybody for your participation this evening. I wish you a better rest of evening. Uh, than we've had, but um, it's been a fabulously educational event. So thank you to our panel and we wish you all good night.